Wednesday evening in May <coughs> as we continue the study of Daniel. As we look at him, uh, we come to chapter 5 uh, in verses 31 through 614, and I'll tell you why 31 in a few minutes. Um, but uh, <coughs> we're going to see uh, Daniel in a predicament like we're kind of almost seeing ourselves today in our country. We've got to make a stand for something. So, you know, title this is Jerusalem Window. And if you know about Daniel, we'll talk about praying. And so he was uh, put in a predicament where either he obeyed God's word or he obeyed a, a law that maybe it wasn't too uh, uh, legal, at least as far as what God was concerned. Now, the reason we started at chapter 5, verse 31, is because um, really verse 31 kind of goes over to chapter 6 and becomes part of chapter 6 as we go to chapter 6, 1 through 14. That should have been there. And uh, we'll see that um, verse 31. And Darius the Mede took the kingdom being uh, about three score and two years old. Now, we'll get to that in a minute, but... Uh, Need to get get some background here. Um, uh, let me ask you something. If uh, if you uh, you know everybody talks about going to heaven, everybody talks about who they're going to see in heaven, and who they're going to sit down. Well, what would be maybe maybe ten of the men that you would like to see in heaven? Sit down and have a conversation with, have fellowship with them. Um, some of the greatest men that you can think of. And now sometimes people will put uh, Jesus in there, put Christ in there, but you can't put him in the same category really. As other men, but you may think of uh, well Moses, uh, maybe Elijah, uh, Paul especially. Paul was probably one of the greatest grace men uh, in in the Bible that we would know of, and uh, we would think about those. Uh, Joseph, and I think Daniel would be in that first ten too. Daniel, you know, uh, uh, has never had anything wrong because Daniel. Because the Bible doesn't say anything, a bad word about Daniel. He was faithful. Uh, he was taken from his home as a teenager. He was taken to a foreign land. Yet we never hear Daniel griping, complaining, uh, but just kind of staying strong in his faith in what God was going to do. He never got back home again. Uh, he lived under two empires and, and still was uh, on top in both of those kingdoms that, that he was under, both of them. And... Uh, He's going to be thrown in the lion's den, and he basically has a good time. So I think Daniel, if you want to model your life after, they say Paul, Peter, whatever. I think Daniel is one we could look at for that. He was, uh, I think some theologians call him the uncompromising Daniel, and he was an uncompromising people. Not like today. Today we have a lot of compromising going on in the Christian community. We call it Christendom, churches, all of that. We have a lot of compromise, but Daniel would not compromise. You remember, he wouldn't eat the king's meat. He wouldn't drink the king's wine. We know Daniel was uncompromising, and he's coming into this situation again. And maybe many of us are going to have to make a decision like Daniel, too. Not the same type, maybe. Maybe close to it. Uh, but we need Daniel's strength today, too, as we get challenged as Christians, as our world seems to be getting worse and worse. So I think we need to look at that. So let's look at Daniel. Daniel. Um, think, think of it for uh, about a half a century. century he went to Jerusalem's window and prayed. Maybe for about 50 years, Daniel prayed. Um, he saw somewhere in, in Psalms, I think it is, that you pray three times a day. Daniel did three times a day. He went to his open window, faced Jerusalem, and prayed. Um, and even even when we flew into uh, Israel with, with the plane, uh, the Jewish people would get back there doing their praying. And they always tried to always face Jerusalem. So when they pass the law that you're not supposed to... Uh, make a request to God or man or anything for about 30 days, uh, what is Daniel going to do? Just like we may have that. We've had that during uh, some things in our country, not to do this, not to do that for a couple of weeks, two weeks, or whatever. Seems to still be going on. What are you going to do? Uh, closed churches. Some churches stayed open. Some reopened after a couple of weeks or at least 30 days for the COVID. And they got in trouble for it, but that seemed to stand up. Are we going to stand up like them? Uh, so would you think Daniel would change his course because it, you know, the law was that you're going to be put in the lion's den. In other words, you're going to be killed. So Daniel's life was on line. Was he going to do it? Was he going to stop, uh, not pray? Um, but no, 
Daniel did. Uh, you see, that's when a law violates God's law. And when that happens, that makes it right for us to do it. God tells us in Romans 13, we are to obey the, the laws. That's why the church did what they did under COVID. And we are to obey uh, country's laws. But then when they break and violate God's law, there's, there's something else there we have to make a decision about. So, in <clears throat> verse 31, we just read it. There was a king. Let me bring this up to speed so we understand that he didn't take the kingdom. And I'll show you that in a minute. There, there was a king in Media uh, named Astalgis. He was the king of the Medo-Persian Empire. Remember, these two empires were put together, the Persians and the Medes. And right now, he was the king, Astalgis. He had two children, uh, Syraxes II, uh, and a daughter named Mon Mondani. Now, Mondani married a man named Cambias, and they had a son named, guess what, Cyrus the Great. Okay. Now, Syraxes II is actually Darius here. Is he Darius here? And as his famous name in the Bible is called Darius, is actually called Syraxes II. Uh, you say as a title, but in his famous name is uh, Darius uh, in this passage. This is uh, um, his more favorite. Now, he is, as it said down there, and Darius the Mede, Mede and took the kingdom being about three score in two years old, which is, means he was about 62 years old about this time. Now he was, uh, he is the, or was I guess a past tense there, was the uncle of Cyrus the Great. Now he didn't have any children, we'll see that later. Now Cyrus the Great is a believer. And like Alexander the Great, for 200 years later he is going to conquer the whole world very fast. Now well, and while Cyrus is going on to conquer the rest of the kingdom uh, that he goes through like, like Alexander, uh, Cyrus goes back to stabilize his empire and he calls on Darius to his uncle to be the king of the empire. Like I say, he had no children, so there's no heir to him. So he became, so he would leave him in charge of that kingdom, just like and writing on the wall, Belshazzar's dad was off in Tima. Uh, so he, he was running. He turned it over to him. And because Cyrus the Great, uh, there will be thousands of people, really because of him, in heaven we get there. Now also Darius, or Syraxeres II, uh, it is, he is going to um, be a believer later on too. Before he dies, he is converted and he, uh, he is saved. Uh, so we see in verse 31 that he actually received the kingdom. He didn't take the kingdom. Like I said, we're going to explain that. He didn't take it. He didn't take it by force. Um, he just was given it by his uh, by Cyrus, his uncle, to do that. Now, Sir Exorcist or Dreyarus, he was given the kingdom, and General Gobrias, which we've heard before, was with him at the time. General Gobrias was with him, and... Uh, part of the uh, the Medo-Persian army that, that came together. Now, the Medo-Persian Empire, will, like I say, will rule for about 200 years. Now, after he's gone for a while, after Darius runs the kingdom for a while, Cyrus the Great does come back. He comes back to the kingdom. Um, and they, uh, he takes back over. Now, the Medo-Persian Empire turns into the Parthenians. Now, um, the reason I say that is because the Parthenians were never conquered. They were never conquered by Rome. Rome conquered all the world that they knew, but he never conquered the Parthenians. Uh, and understand, too, the Persians was a great empire. Now, we hear about the Greeks and the Romans and all that, but the Persians, they were the great empire. They gave us math. They gave us science, astrology. Uh, they were greater, really, than, than the Greeks or anything else. They gave us all these things. Now remember, about 18 months after Jesus was born, the two years, because of the astrology that came from Persia, we have those three kings that we talk about around Christmas time. So really the Persians were greater than that. Now, the Persians were never conquered until Mohammed finally came and defeated, defeated them. Not until then were they ever defeated. Now, where the handwriting on the wall and the empire of Babylon fell, 
it was 539 B.C. That's when the medieval Persian Empire took over and Darius was put in as the king of the empire. This is when Cyrus the Great said to, uh, remember, uh, they said he was going to let them go back. Remember that um, they had been over there since 586 B.C. They didn't give give God that sabbatical year after every seven years, so they were 70 years in captivity. God said you would be there. They were there from 580, 586 to 516 B.C. Now, Cyrus comes, comes back after his going out. Like I said, he came back. Darius was there for about three years, 539 to 536 B.C. Cyrus the Great comes back about 536 B.C. And he says, Israel, you don't belong here. You can go back to your land. Now they start back roughly by 536 B.C. Now they don't complete it to 516. The reason is they built their houses first. That's what they did when they started going back. They all started building their houses. Now understand, all the Jews did not leave. When you remember the first Iraq war, you had a synagogue over there. Some of the Jews never left. But anyway, so they started going back and they built their house. Then they started building the temple, which we we're supposed to do for and under Zerubbabel, which is the temple that's built that Herod became known as Herod's camp temple because he did some modifications to it at Jesus' time. It wasn't a separate temple. Zerubbabel's temple just got updated by Herod, and then they called it Herod's temple. But it really under Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel got him out there and said, get out of here. You've got to be building God's house. You can't be building your houses. That's where it wouldn't come into that. But then they started at, back, and they finally got back after they built the temple in 516 B.C. So from 516 B.C., let's give you some background on what's going on, till 323 B.C., the death of Alexander the Great, the Jews had their golden era. All the wars were going around them and everything else, but they were left alone and they had the golden era. Nobody bothered them under that thing from 516 to 323 B.C. at Alexander's death. Um, why? Because they had learned their lesson and they got back to God. And the balances were correct again. If you remember what we talked about last week, balances, they left God out, so the balances were weak. Uh. They were out of balance because they had taken God out of their culture. When they put God back in his culture, they started getting their, their citizens back, their nation back. How about our souls? You see, when we take God out of our life, we're unbalanced. See? When we put God back in our life, we get balanced again. And we have purpose and meaning and relationship to God. But when he's taken out, say, boom, we're so far out of balance that we maybe have distress, we don't feel right, there's something wrong, no things are going right. We know there's something missing in our life. That's because God's out. Well, that's what happened to Israel. They took God out of it, like we've seen our country taking God out. I mentioned that. Are we out of balance in our country? Because we've taken God out of everything. And so that's what happened. They got back, and then they, they had those wonderful years because they got back. They built a temple. They started studying the Bible. Again, if you read it, they, they sat there and read the Bible for a couple hours, and nobody moved. They did all the things that they needed to do. And they started worshiping again. They got rid of all the idols and everything else. But they, again, went away from God. They, again, they went away. They started building altars and the immorality, and finally God had to scatter them again about 70 A.D., and they're still that way today until Christ comes back. He's bringing them back to, to Jerusalem. They keep coming back here and there, off and on. But one day they will come back, and Jesus will have them there. So they got away. Just like our country, we started out with godly principles, godly standards, living, trying to live a godly life, trying to run a nation as God wanted us to, setting up our, our, our government the way it's set up, the three different branches, all that. God showed us how to do that. And we did that, and we won all our wars up until we started taking God out of our country. Then we had stalemates, and we quit winning them all. Divided countries, didn't win them, left countries, because we're out of balance. You see the same thing. Now, verse 31, now when you read that, you can understand it. Now, Darius the Medes, Sir II, the Median, received the kingdom, being about three score and Two years old, 62 years old. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty princes, which 
should be over the whole kingdom. Now, here you got you got verse one. You got whole. You got 120 20 princes. Now they're going to be divided into groups of 40, and they each have a president over each of those groups. So you got groups of 40. There's 40, 80, 120. All of the three groups, three presidents. Now, Daniel is going to be the president, the number one over all the other groups. Remember, they came in, they told Daniel that he was going to be number three and um, and put all there, and he had the, had the garments over there, and and they recognized him, and they told him to be number one. They didn't were. Now, he, he was over all of those other three, and they got jealous of him because he was a Jew, and they were Medes and Persians, and they weren't going to have a Jew in charge of that. Sounds like some of the things we do to some of our people today, isn't it? We get jealous if they get ahead or something, and we don't want them to be in charge. And so we have the same thing. We get jealous like they did. And they did not want him to rule over them. They just did not want it to happen. But Daniel was going to be in charge. In verse 2, And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give account unto them, and the king should have no damage. In other words, they're going to report to Daniel. Everything they did, they were going to have to report to Daniel. And because Daniel was prepared. Now, Daniel hasn't, we haven't seen Daniel uh, for a while. Daniel's been preparing. He's been reading the Bible. He's been reading Jeremiah. He's been reading Ezekiel and all that. But he waited his turn. Daniel didn't do anything. Uh, he just waited his turn. Remember, he was, you haven't heard from him maybe, uh, I think about 23 years roughly now. Daniel wasn't there. But Daniel was waiting his time. And there's another principle um, like that. I mean, God uses prepared men. That's, that's one thing we need to understand. We need to be prepared. We have, we have to have some way of being put, you know, like a preacher needs some, some things of how to put sermons together, getting some kind of training. We need to be prepared and God can use us. Well, Daniel kept studying, he kept praying, he kept talking to God and he became prepared. Now, like this is in Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Let's quick go through here. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shurtim and came to Jordan. Jordan. And he and, and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that, that the officers went through through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way before. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. And Joshua spoke with the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark and the Covenant, and went before the people. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that I was with Moses, and so I will be with thee. Prepared. He stayed under Moses for years, over 40 years. He waited, he waited. He didn't try to take over before he was supposed to. He just kept doing what he was supposed to do. He kept getting prepared and prepared. And he, God put him in charge because he was a prepared person, just like Daniel. He was preparing himself. Uh, he did not get jealous of Moses, uh, but he just watched, he studied, he listened, and he learned. And after God buried Moses, he turned Joshua the prepared man to take over running the nation of Israel. And like I said, it's because God always uses a prepared person. And Daniel was the only prepared person in the empire that God could use. Like I say, for 23 years, they ignored Daniel, but he just kept studying the Psalms, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. It says in verse 3 that, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Excellent spirit. He was stabilized. He studied for 23 years. He, stayed, he knew what he believed. Boy, man, I wish I could say that to some people today. They're, they're prepared. Um, they're studied. Um, 
they were stable. I mean, I talked to people, and they can't make up their mind about certain passages. One time, they said, well, I was this, and then I was that. Well, I believe this, I believe that, I believe this. I've never seen some, some people so confused sometimes in, in our pulpits and, and teaching people that, that can't get settled on what they, want, what they really believe. And so they won't go from one to the other. And so that's, that's, that's some kinds of the rarity. But he went to the window three times a day. Think about that. Three times a day at that window for over 50 years. That was persistent, and that was the faith he had. You see, Daniel knew God better than any man alive at that time uh, that has ever lived, except maybe Paul and John, maybe. They may have known God as much as good as Daniel did. But Daniel at that time, he knew God better than anyone. And, and Paul and, and John come about close from that. In verse 4, Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Now, isn't that something? They didn't find any fault in him. They were looking hard to, to find something wrong. Then said these men, We shall not find, this is the greatest verse, any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Wow, what an uncompromising Daniel. He was going to keep to God's law. But are we are we really doing that today? Are the Christians today, are Christian leaders, denominational leaders, whatever you want to call them, are they keeping to the law of God? Are they standing strong on it? When I see guys apologize for what they've said for the last few years, I'm sorry about what I've said about homosexuality and uh, same-sex marriage for years. I'm, I'm sorry I said that. He's apologizing for it. When they're not strong, it seems like the pressure gets on our clergy and our guys that are leading our denominations, and yet they're changing their mind. And for what God says, they're changing under everything. I don't have to tell you all those things. You know, you see it in the churches. You see what we've accepted in the church today and what we're doing in the church today. We look more like the world than we do anything else. We're taking on world policies instead of, uh, of doing like the Bible says. We treat everybody fair. We don't need any laws to do that. Maybe the people in the country, but not the church. It says we're to treat everybody equal. Everybody. Because we're all made by the, in the image of God. So we're not supposed to be doing all this. So why are we taking on, on social programs and ruining our denominations by doing that? Where's our com compromising stand? Find no fault in Daniel except obeying God's law. We find a lot of fault in Christians. Boy, I say sometimes if you say something or give somebody something and don't tell me you haven't experienced because I just have in the last few weeks. Seems to have lost a friend. And I didn't really say anything. Just showed him a video about what was going on. And he didn't contact us at all. and not said anything. Boy, isn't that a shame? That we can't even allow anybody's opinion and that goes on. It's just something. But Daniel had that greatest compliment. A person in the Bible. He's a person of God. He did not compromise and stand. He stood firm in what God wanted him to say. And he stayed in there and he did that. Not like today. But look at verse 6. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him. And King Darius lived forever. Well, you know, you give that comment there. And uh, what they were going to do is Daniel wasn't here. Daniel was out somewhere. Not all the kings and princes were there. Hey, Daniel was out somewhere. He was not there. He was going about doing the business of the empire like he was supposed to. They wanted it that way. They didn't want Daniel there. Uh, they wanted this meeting without him. And so in verse 7, and the presidents and the kings and the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains having consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, thee O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. It's always a few people. You know, they say every all the king. No, they weren't there. Daniel wasn't there. And if Meshach, Reverend, and Abednego, they weren't there either if they were alive at this time. They were not there. They were doing that. Daniel behind his back. You see, all everything always starts with a small group. 
And if you check any church split, any church which has problems, starts with maybe one or two, three or four or five or six people. Even though I share, people share with me, well, this group over here wanted to do something about the pastor. And this guy's, I don't want nothing to do with it. He has shared it with me. That's what happens. It always starts with a small group. And that's what's happening here with a small group. And all that trouble always comes that way. You see, the Medes and the Persians, they, they were, and they were the first empire too. Let me tell you, they were the first empire to make the king subject to the laws. Wouldn't it be great today if our presidents and all that was subject to the laws that, that we made? But they did, and they're, they're very smart people. They made the king subject to the law. And in a weak moment, they signed it. You see, the law slowed down. I mean, think about it. You can't do anything without talking to the king. Let's say, you come close to it here. You can't do anything without the president telling us we can do it. Slow down everything. Say a company or say, uh, say, say the military, say the Air Force. Well, you can't do it until that four-star tells you you can do it. Period. Everything goes from third. It would slow down everything. It would ruin economy. It would ruin business. You couldn't do it that way. You see, it had one purpose, and that was to get rid of Daniel. They didn't care what it did to the economy. Didn't didn't care what it was going to do. It slowed down the kingdom. They're just trying to get rid of him. They didn't really care about the uh, empire. They were just so jealous and wanted to get rid of Daniel so bad they were willing to do anything to get it done, even if it hurt them. So, and so these guys. That was that was that was their purpose to do that. Now Darius goes and on a motion. They had Darius here. They they buttered him up, called him all this, and King live forever, and all this. Now King, uh, throw the dot lions den, and uh, let's do eight and nine. Now, O King, establish the decree and sign the writing that it may may not change according to the law of the Medes and Persians. Like I said, he had to be hold up to it, which altereth not. Wherefore, King has signed the writings and the decree. Um, he was emotionally caught up. Boy, they had his they had his ego way up there. And um, they said, oh, man, this is going to be great. Look, I'm going to have total control. Can't do anything. And they were just feeding away, and he did. And so uh, over the law, and he caused him to, to make that decision. He regretted it, as always happens that way. When we make emotional decisions to do something, we find out, wow, I really shouldn't have made that decision. Whether it's buying something or challenging something, uh, there's a lot of people that have, have done stuff like that in the church and wish they hadn't done. They go, oh, we should have done that. Sometimes you buy something, you look back, oh, I shouldn't have bought that. You know, we do that when we make decisions emotionally and we don't rationally think them through. We don't take take the time to see, well, what's going to happen? What is the consequences that's going to happen? Is it really going to solve the problem? Is it going to do it? Like we see through us, all this, we've still got COVID. COVID's still around. We're still talking about it. In fact, the statistics that I've seen, it hasn't changed anything. In fact, if some of the people where they mask and shut down and locked in have more cases now than the states that didn't. But they tried it. Sometimes it's just emotion. We got afraid. We're afraid. Afraid of dying, afraid of getting sick because we were told it was going to kill us. And that's what happens. And we make emotional decisions and it doesn't work. And it didn't stop Daniel. So now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into the house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled down. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did oftentimes before. He didn't care. He said, that's a bad law. You can't tell me I can't talk to my God. You can't tell me I can't talk to him, pray to him. No. See, they knew they were going to get him. Then these men assembled and found Daniel. Daniel didn't hide it. Praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spoke to before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed? They said to God, God him because he was subject to the law. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of, of any God or man within thirty days shall save of thee, O king? shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor 
the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. See, they caught him. That's what their purpose was, was to do that. Daniel prayed openly. He knew it. He wasn't cared. He was just going to do it anyway. It was a bad law, and I'm not going to obey it. That's what it is. Then the king, when he heard these words, was so displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till going down of the sun to deliver him. Say the king knew he made a mistake. Now at the time, he emotionally made that decision. But see, later he was sorry about it. Why? Because he liked Daniel. He loved Daniel. He got along with Daniel. He believed in Daniel. And yet he saw the mistake he did. They buffaloed him into making that decision. And the king cannot go back on his word. And so later we'll see that Daniel was thrown in the, in the lion's den. But I want to show you that you, when you make emotional decisions, you may regret them, and you usually always do at the end. And you look back and see, and you remember that, oh, man, why did I make that decision? What caused me to do that? I should have never done that. And that's what happened. But you see, you know, Daniel knew Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. That's why Daniel could stand, stand strong. strong. But are, are we going to stand, stand strong? Can you stand strong? In all this time of turmoil, if, if it gets worse, or can you stand strong? Are you strong in God's Word? When you look around and see what's going on, and you know it's not right in the church you're in or where you're going, yet you still go there? Because of of your you like it or you got other friends there, but you know what they're teaching or what's going on isn't there. We have some of our churches that they're starting to have cross dressers in there and transgenders in there and homosexuals in there, and you know that's against God's word. Are you still there because of that? Maybe you're not being really taught. Maybe you're just getting uh, baby messages just uh, going on, and you're not really learning the Bible. Why are you there? Are you willing to make a stand for God? Go. Can you make a stand for God? How strong is your belief? Are you the uncompromising Daniel? Or are you the weak king? Dealing with emotions and how you feel. Is where you're at. But to be strong, you first have to know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. Daniel knew God better than anybody else. And the only way you're going to know God is to accept Jesus Christ, your God, into your life. Jesus Christ is God-man. Came to this earth. And you need to believe that. You need to realize that you are separated from, from God. You're an enemy of God. And you need to realize that. Acknowledge that. And then believe that Jesus did come. Took on human form. Went to the cross of Calvary. Died for your sins. Shed his blood and paid the penalty for your sin. The price of a death. And rose again on the third day. And now is in heaven. Marching over us. Interceding for us, the Bible says. You need to believe that, but you need to believe it. You need to confess it with your mouth. Believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth and ask Jesus into your life. Nobody can do it for you. Darius, Cyrus the Great later, Nebuchadnezzar, all that people could be in heaven because of all these men came to know God in a personal way, and you can too. And he can give you the strength to stand for him, for him to stand up for him and his word give you that strength and that stability that Daniel had let me pray Father again we just thank you for this time thank you for today thank you for the rain that we had today Father we just really appreciate it we do need more but we're grateful for what we got and Lord we just uh, thank you for the salvation that you provided for us we thank you for your word and Father just help us to grow each time we open your word may we learn something new in Jesus name we pray Amen